sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us this week for worship. This is a special week for all of us here at Elation Church because this is our 100th consecutive service. Yeah, Elation Church has been going now for 100 weeks. But guess what? We're not just an online church anymore because we have live services every week in Four Corners, Florida. If you live in South Claremont, Davenport, Champions Gate, come out and join us on Sunday at 10 o'clock at Citrus Ridge Academy. Now, many people around here don't know Citrus Ridge Academy by the name, but everybody knows Sand Mine Road. So Citrus Ridge Academy is just off of Highway 27 on Sand Mine Road. As we get started with our worship service today, I want you to join in and sing with us. Now, the psalmist put it like this. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Let's bless the Lord together and lift up our voices. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your life. I thank you for your truth. And as we look into your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will cause this word to come alive on the inside of us, 
to impact our hearts and impact our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to week number three in our series where we are discovering who God is by studying the names that He gave us to identify Himself in the Scriptures. Now, let's start out by talking about what names are all about. Have you ever been to an event where they gave you that little name badge that says, Hello, my name is, and then you write your name down? Yeah, I've been to a lot of those, and I always write Dean on my name tag. Now, names signify identity. Names signify identity. Now, I told you that I always write Dean on my name tag, but technically, my name, my legal name in the state of South Carolina, I didn't even find this out until I was like 13 or 14 years old when I wanted to play high school football. I had to produce a state birth certificate. And 13, 14 years old, I found out that my parents didn't name me before we left the hospital. So my hospital birth certificate has unnamed Forrest as my name. My state birth certificate actually had no name Forrest. So that's my real name, I guess. No name Forrest. Now, I did have to get that changed to the name I had been going by all of those years. But there's an asterisk on my state birth certificate. And my name is now Jeffrey Dean Forrest, the name that they named me after we left the hospital. I also have another name that signifies my identity, and that is I am a Christian. Christian is not just something that's added on to my life. It's who I am. It's my identity. So the first thing we realize is that names signify identity. But we also have names that signify relationship. You have a lot of those. I have a lot of those. I mean, I'm the son that's one of my names. I'm a son of my mom and dad. Um, but my mom never called me son or even introduced me as her son. She always introduced me as her baby, even when I'm 50 years old and she's introducing someone, introducing me to someone, she'll say, this is my baby, Dean. So my name is Baby. That's one of my relationship names. That's what my mom called me was Baby because I'm the youngest of four siblings. And then when I got married to Gaina, I became a husband. So that's one of my relationship names is husband. But she doesn't say, oh, husband, would you take out the trash today? No, um, she calls me honey on good days. <laughs> and I like to have more good days than bad days. I'm not going to tell you what she calls me when I'm not acting right or, or being a loving husband like I should every day. But she calls me honey. So that's one of my names. When my son Jeffrey was born, I became a father. So that's one of my relationship names. I am a father, but Jeffrey doesn't say, Oh, father, would you give me $20? No, he, he calls me dad. So those are some of my relationship names. But names do more than signifying identity and relationship because we also have action names or activity names. Names signify action. Names signify what a person does. Now, I have a lot of titles that signify what I have done through the years. I mean, I've been a student and I'm still a student. I'm, I'm a salesman. I've been a salesman. I've, I've been a sound man. I've been a janitor. I've been a screen printer. I've been an A&R director for a record company. Um, I've been a vice president of organizations of, of a business and a in a, a state organization, fellowship organization, and a national organization. I've been a music director at events and even had that title in state and national organizations. I've been an event planner. Um, I've rented venues for events in, in 31 different states, from rodeo arenas to, to civic centers to even the Ryman Auditorium. <laughs> Um, I've, I've done events all over the United States as an event planner. I've been a crusade director. Uh, we did crusades all over the United States. Um, I've been the president of local and national organizations. Um, I've been a conference director. I started a conference in 1998 called the Big God Conference. And for 21 consecutive years, we had over a thousand teenagers come to Myrtle Beach over New Year's. So I've been a conference director. Um, I'm an evangelist, 
since October of 1992 when God called me to be an evangelist. I've been a chaplain of a campground in Myrtle Beach for nine years. A lot of people just call me preacher and I'm the pastor, the lead pastor of Elation Church. So that signifies a lot of my activity. And if you didn't know a lot about me, as I have listed off those things that I've done and those things that I am doing, you learned a lot about who I am by the names that I shared with you. Identity, relationships, and activity. As a matter of fact, that was 27 names, but I'm just one person, even though I shared with you 27 names. So, that brings us to what we're talking about. We're talking about the names of God. And there's a very key verse found in Psalm 910. And here's what it says. It says, and those who know your name, talking about God's name, those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Now, this is a powerful verse. And we need to take hold of this verse, especially during this series, not just during the series, but every day of our lives. Because when we know who God is, by knowing who He is, by knowing His names, when we know God's names in Scripture, then we can put our trust in Him. We can put our faith in Him, our confidence in Him, right? But if we don't know who He is, then we can't put our faith and confidence in someone that we don't even know who He is or what kind of relationship He wants to have with us or what kind of activity He wants to do in our lives we can't put our trust in Him without knowing who He is. And when we know who He is, we can put our faith in Him. And then that verse goes on to give us some great encouragement. It says, For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So, when we discover who God is, and we put our faith in Him, and we seek Him to do that or to be that in our lives based on who He told us He was, then we know that He will not turn His back on us when we seek Him based on who He is. He will not forsake us. He will not turn His back on us. Now, right in the beginning of this series, we found out that God, the name for God in the Bible, in the very first verse, Genesis 1-1, is Elohim. And that means great, mighty, supreme God. And we went on in week one to find out that God has a personal name, just like we have personal names, not just titles. Elohim is a title, but God's name, His eternal name, that His people should recognize Him forever, that name is Yahweh, and it means I am that I am. Last week, we introduced God's name, Yahweh Shalom. And that means I am, Yahweh means I am, and shalom means peace. So we found out that God was peace. Now, we read a verse that I'm going to read again this week. It's, it's Romans 14, 17. And it tells us something about the kingdom of God, the eternal rule and reign of God. All right? It says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not about following the rules. That's not what the kingdom of God is about, even though a lot of people think Christianity is just following a list of rules, a list of what to do and a list of what not to do. No, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, Romans 14, 17 tells us, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, that's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about being right with God, right? It's about having the peace of God and having peace with God. And it's about elation or joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is about. And that's what Christianity is about. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I want to introduce a thought to you. I just want you to think about this. When we take hold of the peace of God that is beyond human understanding, is, is bigger than any peace that the world has to offer, when we take hold of the peace of God by faith, like we talked about last week, 
And when we embrace God's way of being righteous, we will overflow with joy in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again. When we take hold of the peace of God that is beyond understanding, when we embrace God's way of being righteous, then we will overflow with joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now today we're going to focus in on righteousness. We're going to focus in on righteousness. Now, when most people hear the word righteousness, they think about right living. They think about doing right. They think about living right. When we think about that word righteousness, we think about our works. We think about our performance because we think being right or being righteous has to do with what we do and how we live. Works and performance-based righteousness. Now, the Old Testament kind of lets us believe that at times, especially after the law of Moses was introduced on Mount Sinai, you know, the Ten Commandments and the other rules for God's people. I mean, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do this and thou shalt. And you start thinking about those rules and you think, wow, to be right with God, to be right with God, then we've got to keep all the rules, right? So after, <laughs> after the Ten Commandments, We'll find out during our study today that before the Ten Commandments, they didn't think about being right with God by following rules. But after the Ten Commandments from then on, everybody began to focus on, well, I've got to keep this list of rules. The Old Testament has over 670 rules that are listed out. And we've got to keep those rules to be right with God. We've got to keep those rules to be righteous. But... There's something that we need to learn. There's something that we need to take hold of. Let's look. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Now listen, listen to the prophet speaking the word of God as it was given to him. Here's what he says. He says, For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. And this will be his name. Yahweh Sidkenu. The Lord is our righteousness. Now, Prophet Jeremiah, this was a messianic prophecy. This is talking about the Messiah. And it's saying because he came from the line of David. He, was, he, he is raised up as a righteous descendant from King David's line, right? And he ushered in the kingdom of God. And he is the king of the kingdom of God. And he does what's just and right throughout the land. And his name is... The Lord is our righteousness. Yahweh Sidkenu. And that's the name of God that we're going to look at today. Yahweh Sidkenu. And here's what it means. It means I am. Yahweh is I am, right? But Sidkenu is righteousness. So we could say I am righteousness, but that would not be a a correct interpretation of the Hebrew language because built into the words of Yahweh Sidkenu is I am is our righteousness. I am is our righteousness. Now, God's name, Jesus' name, and, and is Yahweh Sidkenu. This is a messianic prophecy. It's talking about there's one coming, and his name is going to be the Lord is our righteousness. Now, God's name, who God is, what God does, right? The relationship that he has with us, it's all wrapped up in his names. And God's name, 
This is some good news right here. God's name takes you and takes me from works-based righteousness, trying to follow rules to be right with God, to a gift-based righteousness. And if you've never comprehended this before or took hold of this, this is, this is going to seem very strange. But see, righteousness in the Old Testament is about keeping rules and it was about works-based righteousness. But by what Jesus did on the cross, righteousness is now gift-based righteousness for you and for me. Let's take a look at some scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Did you hear what this verse says? God made Jesus, who never sinned, to be the offering for your sin and my sin so that you and I could be made right with God through Christ, through what Jesus did on the cross when our sin was nailed to the cross. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Listen to what it says. Oh, what joy. <laughs> I want to say the word elation every time I say joy. Oh, what elation. Oh, what joy. For those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now you and I were born slaves to sin because we were born in Adam and, and we were born in sin and born in Adam. But you know what? When we're born again in Christ then God clears the record of our sin. When I came to Christ in 1974, in June of 1974, see, God dwells in eternity. And when I, when I reached out to Jesus by faith and asked Him to forgive me and confess my sin to Him, you know what? He forgave me and He cleared the record of my sin. Every sin I'd done before that point and, and you know what? God lives in eternity. God doesn't determine my last moment of life. He doesn't predetermine that, but He knows it because He's God and He knows everything. But He takes all of my sin from, from when I was born all the way till the very last sin I commit. And he, he scooped it all up, put it on Jesus on the cross. And you know what? When I came to Christ... My record is clear. There's no record. The Bible is very clear. There's no record of my sin in heaven anymore because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And it's not just me. If you're in Christ, there's no record of your sin. There's no record being kept of your sin in heaven because of what Jesus did on the cross. What joy for those whose record... The Lord has cleared of sin. Romans 4, 8 says that. Let's take a look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Listen to the word of God. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Listen, verse 9. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. You know what? Salvation is God's grace gift. God's grace gift of righteousness. You see, because our sin separates us from a holy God and there's nothing that we can do. We cannot be good enough to erase that sin barrier, but Jesus erased it on the cross. Salvation is a grace gift. Righteousness is a grace gift. What is grace? Listen, listen to this definition of grace. Grace is God's unmerited acts of kindness and favor towards you and towards me because God wants to treat you and me like sin never happened. Let me say that again. 
Grace is God's unmerited acts of kindness and favor towards you and towards me because God wants to treat you and me like sin never happened. And that's a great definition of what grace is all about. Let's take a look at some more scripture. Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Listen to what the Word of God says. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something that they've earned. Listen, but people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. <laughs> How much more plain can it get than this? How can we read this scripture and not just be filled with joy because we realize that God has cleared the record of our sin. Let me read Romans 4, 5 again. It says, People are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. And back before the law, back before the Ten Commandments, at Mount Sinai, referred to as the Law of Moses, you know what? Back before that, people were made right with God because of their faith, just like you and I are made righteous and right with God by faith. Because that's how we receive all of God's grace gifts. We receive them by faith. Listen to Genesis 15, 6. It says this, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted Abraham as righteous because of his faith. <laughs> wow. Abraham believed the Lord. He, he, he believed what God said. And he, he, first of all, he heard it and then he believed it. And then he spoke the same thing that God spoke, right? And then he obeyed. He surrendered to what God had said. And Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous. Why? Because of his works? No. The Bible's very clear that Abraham was counted as righteous because of his faith. Righteousness is received by faith like all of God's grace gifts. We hear from God's Word. We hear from the Holy Spirit. That's, that's how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we hear God's Word. We believe God's Word. We speak God's Word. And then we receive what God has said. We hold on to what God has said. We surrender to what God has said because each one of those could be applied depending on the step of faith that we're taking. Listen to Isaiah. Let's go back to the Old Testament again. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says this, I am overwhelmed with joy. I'm overwhelmed with elation in the Lord my God, for He has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. Wow. Gift righteousness is different than works righteousness because works righteousness, like we talked about, was based on our performance, our ability to keep the rules, right? That's works righteousness. But gifts righteousness is not doing right or living right. Gift righteousness is being right because we have the right clothing. We've, we've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. It's like draped on us. When we come to Christ, we take off our robe of unrighteousness. It's like dirty rags, our righteousness. And then we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, because he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be righteous, so that we could be right with God. Now, John 16, verses 8 through 10 says this, And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, this is Jesus talking, and he's talking about when he ascends back to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes to be with us and in us and on us, when He, the Holy Spirit, comes, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sin. That's the first step of someone coming to Christ is they realize that they're a sinner and that their sin separates them from God. And the Holy Spirit convicts the world of its sin. But the Holy Spirit does something else. 
after we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit convicts us, convinces us of God's righteousness. And then the Holy Spirit lets the enemy know through our victorious living, the Holy Spirit lets the devil and demons know that there's judgment coming, that God wins. <laughs> God is the victor. Christ is the victor. So let's continue in verse 9. John 16, 9 said, The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. That's the sin that would eternally stop someone and separate someone from God forever because if they refuse to believe in Jesus, that's the sin that can't be forgiven, right? If they just say that, I don't believe. I don't want to believe in Jesus. Don't want nothing to do with Jesus. So the Holy Spirit convicts the world of its sin and the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in Jesus. And then verse 10, it says, righteousness is available. That's what Jesus said. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more is what Jesus said. Here's the good news today. Righteousness is available. Being right with God is available through Christ's finished work on the cross. Righteousness is available to become right with God. Righteousness is available to be right with God. See, there's a difference between becoming right with God. That happens when we put our faith and trust, when we believe in Jesus, when we surrender our lives to Him, when we confess our sin to Him. Right? That's when we become right with God. But righteousness is available for you and for me today to be right with God. And when we, <laughs> when we be right with God, I know that's not good English, but you know what? Then we're free from guilt. We're free from shame. We're free from condemnation. And that's where God wants us to live. If we're in Christ, God wants us to be free. He wants us to live free and righteous lives. Now, how do we receive this righteousness? Because it's available. The righteousness to be right with God and live right with God is available. But how do we receive it? See, for way too many years of my Christian life, I, I just focused on myself. And I lived under guilt and shame and condemnation because I would, I would always mess up because when I came to Christ, it didn't mean that I never sinned again. Right? Wouldn't that be awesome? But it doesn't mean that because I still mess up. I still sin. But you know what? Just because I sin, it doesn't mean that I'm not right with God anymore. We've all said it about people. That person is just not right with God. Well, guess what? If they're in Christ, they're right with God because being right with God is not based on a person's actions. Being right with God is based on a person being in Christ and what Christ did on the cross. So, if those people are in Christ, they're right with God because you can't be right with God based on your actions, so why should you expect them to be able to? Right? So we receive this righteousness to be right with God, to become right with God when we came to Christ and when we were forgiven, but to be right with God and not be under shame and guilt and condemnation anymore, we receive it by faith. So we've heard the word. Here's the question. Do we believe the word that we're right with God based on what Jesus did on the cross, not based on our ability to perform? If you believe that, then you got to put your mouth in agreement with what God's Word has said, and you have to receive it. So, I want to share this with you. I want you to repeat it after me. Would you do that? I know you may feel silly doing that if you're, if you're watching on your cell phone or your TV in your house, or if you're around other people, but I say we got to put God's Word in our mouth in order to act in faith. That's according to the Scripture. I believe, therefore I spoke, is what the psalmist said and what the New Testament says. Listen, let's say this together. According to God's Word, go ahead and say it. According to God's Word, I am clothed in Christ's righteousness. I am clothed in Christ's righteousness. Say it. My record is cleared. 
Say it. I reject shame, guilt, and condemnation. Say it out loud with your mouth. I receive righteousness by faith. I double dog dare you to say it. <laughs> and listen, every time, every time, you might want to write this down. You might want to put it in your phone. You might want to write it down on a piece of paper and stick it to the mirror in your bathroom. I do that a lot to, to confess God's word on a daily basis. But listen, Everything that I'm saying just is coming from the verses that I just read to you. So we've heard the Word of God. We believe the Word of God. Now we confess the Word of God. We speak what God says. So, one more time. The great thing about video is you can pause it and back it up a little bit. And you can watch it again and write it down. But I'm going to say it one more time. I am clothed in Christ's righteousness. My record is cleared. I reject guilt, shame, and condemnation. And I receive righteousness by faith. Every time guilt, shame, or condemnation tries to beat you down. It's not God beating you down. It's not the Holy Spirit beating you down. Because the Holy Spirit will always point you to Christ and point you to the Word of God and point you to the truth. So, anytime you feel defeated and beat up and guilt and shame and condemnation, say these things. Put your mouth in line with God's Word and receive His righteousness. I'm clothed in Christ's righteousness. My record is clear. I reject shame, guilt, and condemnation, and I receive the righteousness of Jesus by faith. Just like Moses, I'm mean, just like Abraham, <laughs> believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. I believe God and it's accounted to me as righteousness. Now, if you're not in Christ today, you're not right with God because you haven't put your faith and hope and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And guess what? You can move from being in sin to being in Christ today. And Here's how that happens. You realize that you're a sinner. You confess your sin to God. The Bible says if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just and He will forgive you and He will wash you clean. He will make you righteous. Is another way of saying that. So today, if you will confess your sin to God, today, if you will call on the name of the Lord, and the name of the Lord means that you're surrendering your life, all that you are, all that you have to God. It's like saying this. Hey, God, up until now, my life's just been all about me and what I want and what I love on this earth and the people that I love on this. My life's just been all about me. But from now on, I want my life to be about you too. And if you'll do those things today, God will hear you. He will forgive you. He will make you right with Him. He will give you His gift of eternal life. And if that's what you want to do, I ask you to pray with me right now. Let's pray together. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. Go ahead and tell Him that. I believe you died on the cross for me, in my place, for my sin. And I believe you rose again from the grave, just like the Bible says. I realize today that I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I broke your rules. I ask you to forgive me. And help me to turn away from the sin that's in my life. By the power of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit. Because I can't do it just in my own strength. And Jesus, today I ask you to be my Lord. I surrender my life to you. Up until today, my life's just been all about me. But from today on, I want my life to be about you. I want to live for you. I want to know you. I want to follow you. Jesus, thank you. For forgiving me. Thank you for adopting me into your family. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to be in me and with me. And Jesus, thank you for your gift of eternal life. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, we want to send you something. It's a small book. It says How to Find God. And it's a New Testament of the Bible, but it has about 40 little devotions in the front of it that'll help you 
in this new relationship with Christ. It'll get you on the right track. And we want to send it to you. Now, I have to know your mailing address. I, you can't buy it. Now, this is a gift from Elation Church. Our partners make it possible for us to share this gift with you and to give this gift to you so you can't buy it, all right? But if you will reply under this video with your mailing address, or if you don't want other people to see your name and mailing address, you can go to our website, www.elation.church, scroll down on the page and it has a place there to send us a message and would you say i prayed with you today and then give me your address nobody will be able to see it but us here at elation and we'll put this gift to you in the mail as soon as possible within this week it'll be in the mail to you and that'll be our gift to you because we want you to get started right in this new relationship with jesus Thanks again for joining with us this week here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. Would you prayerfully consider partnering with us in our mission? There are two ways that you can do that today. First of all, if today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? All you have to do is tap that share button right under the video. Another way you can partner with us is partnering with us financially to help us to continue to purchase Bibles, to give to people who come to Christ, and to continue to reach out to the 100,000 people here in Four Corners that aren't in church on any given Sunday morning. Would you consider partnering with us financially? It's easy, it's fast, it's secure to text to give. All you have to do is text the word ELATION to 28950 and follow the prompts. In partnering with us in any of these ways, you'll be joining with us in our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. And we'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.